All right, we're live. Hello, everybody out there who is not watching. There's nobody watching right now. But if you were watching, you would welcome. know we're about to do a show. So welcome to the show. Uh, so I'll introduce everything, and we'll just jump right in, I guess. Uh, there's Cattail waving in the back there. All right. Um, so for, OK, whatever. I'll just start the show. Nobody's going to hear this. <laughs> OK. Uh, all right. Hello and welcome to Get It Made. This is episode three, Staying Productive. My name is Mike Lipson. I'm Ben Marshalkowski. And we're going to spend, I don't know, a little bit of time today <laughs> talking about uh, some productivity, creativity, uh, kind of just some ways to stay on top of stuff and how to get done what you want to get done. So uh, let's see. We can jump right in today. Uh, normally, we're probably going to have some bumpers and other kind of production stuff, and today uh, just didn't happen. So we're going to be working on that for next week. Uh, if you want to get a little preview of what that's going to look like, you can actually take a look at last week's show where I showed off some of that stuff uh, in its kind of pre-made state. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is jump into our first segment, which is called In the News. And we're going to talk about some stuff that happened this week in the world of our purview, productivity, creativity, that kind of thing. Uh, and I brought a story this week about the Mac OS X Yosemite beta release, uh, specifically because that's something I've been kind of getting my feet wet with this week. I downloaded the beta probably against my better judgment since uh, I've only got the one Mac right now, and I don't have multiple partitions where I can test separately. So I installed it on my main system, which was probably a mistake but I like it a lot. It's got a few things that still need some work, but uh, potentially very useful for productivity stuff later on. Um, have you explored at all what's going to be in this release when it does come out? Um, I've heard a little bit about it. Um, I have not taken the leap to installing it on either of my machines at this point, um, but it, from what I've seen, it looks very cool. Um, I've unfortunately been a little bit out of the loop the past week, but... Uh... Yeah. Have you... So I mentioned to everyone last week that you were out because you had a detached retina. So welcome yeah. back. Thank Glad you. you're uh, doing okay. So Still you were... Over. Yeah, so you were not able to use screens, or what was the situation? Basically, um, because the eye was basically, like, still healing, I was not allowed to read or write anything. I could, like, watch... TV and like kind of just stare at a screen, but I couldn't like do anything that involved rapid eye movement. So um, yeah, I, I couldn't like read up on articles or anything like that. It was a lot of a lot of Netflix, and then when I got tired of Netflix, it became a lot of tutorials on YouTube. Uh, okay. Well, so that's productive. It Good was. Yeah, I figured I found a way I could be at least a little bit productive despite being very limited in what I could do. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad that only lasted a week or so, because that just sounds tough. Yeah. Because you caught up on your Netflix. <laughs> That's true. So speaking of getting caught up, <clears throat> the reason I mentioned the uh, Mac OS X beta, aside from the fact that I'm a big Mac fan, is that there are some features coming in the new version of OS X that are going to be really, really good for productivity and just general kind of device use. Um, and actually, because of the nature of my setup, I don't have access to any of them right now. But I can still talk about them. Uh, specifically, they're, they're doing this thing that they're calling continuity, which is actually kind of a, an umbrella that covers multiple features. Uh, but specifically, the, the thing that everybody's really pumped about is called handoff. And the idea is that if you are working on one device or using one device, and you want to move to another device, Apple devices, of course, then they're going to try to make it as seamless as possible for you to do that. So, for example, if you're working on, you know, pages on your desktop, and then someone calls you away and you have to get up, you can grab your phone, and your phone will drop you right into pages with exactly the same document in exactly the same condition, and you can keep working on it. And like it would automatically go to pages for you? Exactly. And not only go to pages, but go to that document and that place in the document and all the changes will be there. And it's going to support not just Apple's applications, but third parties can support it too. So like if I'm working in 
drafts or if I'm working in Byword or whatever other application I like, if, as long as that application supports handoff, then I could move from device to device and be in exactly the same place no matter where I am. Okay, that's really cool, because when you first mentioned it, I thought you were just kind of talking about, like, basically what Google Drive does, where you can go from machine to machine and have it there, but if it, like, somehow knows, you know, what your, I'm assuming through your user settings, you know, that you're working on this thing and brings you like that, that's really cool. Yeah, iCloud right now kind of supports that Google Docs style, you know, your document exists everywhere kind of mentality. This is supposed to take it one step further by not just like having the document available when you go from place to place, but knowing what you were working on and basically like presenting to you whatever you were just doing. So that there's no, like they call it continuity because the idea is that you're moving from device to device, but you're just continuing the same progression of thought. And there's no like, I moved to a different device, now there's a barrier before I can continue doing what I was doing. So they're trying to remove that barrier. Uh, cool. Which I think is really, really cool except that I can't test it because even though I have the new OS X, I do not have the new iOS beta. I have not installed that because that is potentially even more scary of a, of a risk to take with my devices mm -hmm. since if stuff happens, I'm really kind of screwed and there's nothing I can do. So uh, I don't think I'm going to... Even if I could get my hands on the beta, which I probably could even though I don't really have it, um, I probably will not do that. And then even if I did... Have, a, have the beta installed. I think my computer may actually be too old to uh, to do it because it doesn't have Bluetooth LE, which is a, a special piece of hardware that newer Macs have. And my Mac is about four years old. It's in great shape. I'll probably use it for a long time, but it just doesn't have all the new bells and whistles. So without that, I think this feature may never come to me, which is really, really sad. I'm very excited about it. Um, so anyway... There's a lot of other stuff we could talk about in the Yosemite beta, and I'm not going to go on and on and on. Uh, I will say that overall I've had a pretty good experience with it. If you are considering installing it, if you're a, a Mac person like me and you like to be on the bleeding edge, then um, I'll make the same recommendation that Apple makes, which is don't install it on your production machine. If your machine is doing something really important that you absolutely can't not have, don't install this on it because it's potentially uh, bad. <laughs> if it, bad, things could happen that are bad, and ain't nobody going to help you. So uh, so if you want to play around, that's cool. Just don't be stupid like me and install it on your main machine. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff. There's some stuff that doesn't work. There's no guarantee that any application you use is going to work. Most of the applications I use have worked just fine. Uh, I'm having some weird issues with my dock right now where I go down to the bottom of the screen and the dock does not come up. And I have to go into mission control just to get to the dock, which is kind of annoying. And then once the dock comes up, it stays up. I could go on forever. It's just stupid little things. In fact, I'm going to submit a report about it later. But uh, but if you're into testing and you're into being on the bleeding edge, you can play around with it. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, we should move on. We're kind Sorry, of in what? this beta. Uh, we're kind of in this beta culture, it seems like, like especially in video games, where you can get into the beta of a thing now. And so yeah, I that wonder is really if interesting. This increased expectation that now, like you know, your OS is going to be in beta and you're going to download it. Like it could be have kind of dangerous ramifications. Yeah, that's actually a topic that we should save for a discussion sometime because the whole idea of, like, Steam Early Access and other uh, kind of games that you can get in and play before they're really even done is, is totally new, especially to the world of games. And then there's kind of a culture of, well, I bought this game, why doesn't it work right? And yet you bought Early Access, and so you've kind of agreed that you're going to be in this not fully working situation. It's really an interesting discussion to have. Let's uh, let's save that for a future discussion. Yeah, definitely. Well, we promised to move things along this week, so let's move on to DIY, which is our segment about the projects of the week that we think are worth checking out and maybe even contributing to if you have the time. So you brought along Project Gooseberry. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Project Gooseberry, at first I thought it was an open project. It turns out it's not, so it's not something that you can join in on, but it's really interesting to follow. They've actually really just finished building the team and kicked it off. It's basically um, the company that, or not company, but the makers of Blender, which is an open source computer graphics program, um, basically kick-started making a movie and are now working on making this full-length feature movie all in CG, all with Blender, which um, there are obviously... Um, other programs like Maya and 3D Studio Max that are more well known for this sort of thing. Blender's really good, but it hasn't been used to this, quite this extent yet. 
so it's kind of a way to prove the process of it. But basically, they have this blog, which I think we'll have in the show notes, um, and you can follow like all the stuff that they're doing because they're working on so many levels with an international team. So they're both working on how can they coordinate across countries, you know, working on these files and these projects and their storage and stuff like that. They're also working within the program of Blender itself and figuring out, you know, can we use this particle system and use it to affect whole objects to make things easier, like for doing like, you know, a flock of sheep or something. Um, stuff like that. So it's kind of it's kind of cool to see how this project is unfolding and step by step on such a massive scale for an open source software. This is really cool. I'm kind of looking through it right now. And, yeah, I'm, I'm actually a little bit sad that I couldn't just, like, sign up to contribute if I wanted to. This looks really good. Man, I actually just came across some stills from the video, and they look amazing. This is really yeah. cool. There's, there's a lot of links in here about, like, how you can support the project by donating or, uh, you know, picking out their sponsors and stuff like that. Oh, there's a trailer on here, which is really cool. Actually, I'm going to pop that open and see if I can see it. But it just looks like really high-quality CG. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit so I can describe a little bit. So, yeah, it's kind of a uh, like a cartoony kids' movie-looking thing, but, man, there's some really cool, like, hair effects and, and flower petals floating around and really, really interesting. Cool. Actually, uh, I see some names here I recognize, like CG Cookie, which is a... Uh, I've seen their YouTube channel. They have some videos out with tutorials and things like that. This is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow, there's some stuff on their website about game development. Very cool. Yeah, this is something I should follow. Seems like, uh, I wonder whether this, you know, if they make a movie, I'm sure they'll release it, but I wonder what kind of release it could see, whether it's something that, you know, your average person would hear about or if it's just something that'll go around online. But it certainly looks totally professional. It looks fantastic. Yeah, no, I've been kind of, in this past week, I said I was watching tutorials, and a lot of them were Blender videos, and nice. um, I've been kind of getting back into that, which um, is both a blessing and a curse, <laughs> but um, it'll be, uh, it, it, yeah, it's really interesting to see just how much you can do with that program, um, and it's just so cool that it's open source and completely free. Yeah, at some point, I may, uh, if I ever get a chance to dive back in, I may call upon your expertise, because I know I, I kind of sent you the tutorials that you used to get started, but I'm pretty sure you're beyond my level at this point. Like, I haven't looked at it in a while. And are you using it mostly for game stuff or for animation stuff or what? That's my intention is mostly game stuff. I'm fiddling around with animation right now because that will obviously help with, like, if I'm importing something into Unity and stuff like that. But, um, yeah. yeah, primarily game stuff is the end goal. Awesome. So you'll be making game assets, like character models and stuff? Yeah, I'm trying to do some character stuff right now. Cool. That's awesome. That's... Man, there's a level of artistry involved there that I feel like I just can't touch. Like, uh, I just, I've never, you know, I can do, like, music, and I really like programming and other, like, creative endeavors like that. Writing is really fun. But I just do not have a visual art bone in my body. And I, uh, I envy that a little bit in you, that you, you know, you can draw and you can work on this kind of stuff and create something that actually looks like something. I think that's pretty awesome. Well, it's funny. It's funny because I'm usually I'm not good with sculpture in general. Like I can draw okay, but like once it gets to 3D, like in the physical world, it's like really a struggle. But for some reason in Blender, like once you like have control over everything, like you can just kind of break it into 2D parts. It makes it more doable. Yeah, I did see some students of mine. I, I kind of got them started on this path, but I I had them. Um, like taking 2D images and then extruding objects along kind of the contours of the image. Mm -hmm. And then if you do that with like a multiple angle uh, concept shot, then you can actually kind of create 3D without really having to like just guess or sculpt the shape. You just kind yeah. of make sure it follows the image. And mm -hmm. it, it made so much more sense why a company who's making a game or making a movie would need to hire people specifically to make concept art. Like, you think, like, do I really need to pay people to, to make art that's not even going to be in the final product? But without that kind of interstitial piece, you can't get to the 3D model that looks like what you want. You know, the concept artist has to create the concept and, and build it out, and then your 3D modeler can sometimes one-to-one, -one, like, go directly from the concept art to the 3D model. So it really is like an integral part of the process, and it seemed a little bit kind of superficial, but it actually is really, really important. 
Yes, as long as you have a front and a profile and maybe a back, you can do a whole lot. Like I actually built my first character from scratch this over the weekend, and yes. it was cause I, it was because I had like I found a drawing online that had a front, a side, and a back, and was able to build from there. Wow, and it looks pretty good. It like, does. Close it's to the drawing. Close to the original. That is really really cool. Wow, yeah, I'd love to see it sometime. That's awesome. I'll actually um, probably be posting some stuff on my blog about it uh, tomorrow. Nice. So. I'll take a look at that then. Cool. So let's move on to our other project of the week, which I'll talk about pretty quickly. Uh, it's called Habit RPG. And I posted a link in the show notes to the GitHub page for Habit RPG, where you can go and look at all the files and even contribute if you want to, if you're feeling like uh, flexing your web programming muscles. Uh, but Habit RPG is actually a really awesome productivity tool, and it kind of fits into the... Um, the explosion in kind of game-based productivity stuff that we're seeing these, like in the past few years. Um, it's gotten a lot of chatter kind of all over the web. But the idea of Habit RPG, and if you go to habitrpg.com, you can check this out. But the idea of Habit RPG is you sign up, you make a character, and then you build up your character by completing tasks on your to-do list. Oh, my character died. Look at that. <laughs> uh, and so... Much like oh wow, this looks really different from you than the last time I was here. So much like in RPG video games, your character has hit points. It has magic depending on your class. Uh, it's got it gains experience as you do stuff. And basically, you can you can kind of have a system where the uh, tasks that you do earn you experience points. You can level up. You can buy gear. You can earn money. Uh, and you can kind of have the RPG experience, but in your real life, getting your real tasks done which is really, really awesome. Uh, and if you're in need of a to-do management system, kind of a, a task management system, then this you, you can't go wrong with this. It's actually really, really good. I do have another task management system I want to talk about later in the show. But, uh, but this is really great for just uh, people who need like a pretty simple to-do list that they can use to manage their stuff and who want to kind of have that achievement part of things going along with it. So like you can actually you know, make, kind of meet game milestones to motivate you in your real life. Cool. You do, they have a, do they have an app or a mobile presence at all? They do, actually. So I believe they have iOS and Android apps. Uh, okay. the, the site is made, I can't remember exactly what it's made in. They use a framework called Ionic, I think, which mm -hmm. is like, it's basically, um, it's all web stuff. I think it uses, um, what, the, what is the... AngularJS is, is Google's framework for web, web applications. So it's mm -hmm. all built in Ionic, which is I think works with Angular, which, long story short, it's all web technologies. It's just like supersets, stuff that, that's built on top of web technologies to make web stuff easier. Uh, but it's all web programming. If you are uh, you know, comfortable with your JavaScript and your jQuery and your that kind of thing, then you can learn Angular, you can learn Ionic, and you can jump in and play around with this. Um, but, sorry, what, you asked a question about it before, and I kind of went in a different oh, direction. Oh, just if it was uh, mobile or online. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. So because it's a web application, mm -hmm. they basically are able to, I believe, use the same code base on mobile. So if you look at the mobile app, it, it looks different. It's a different layout, but I'm pretty sure it's actually the same site. And it all stays in sync and everything. And the, the web apps, are they're nothing too special, but they work just fine. It's good if you just need to stay on top of kind of what you're doing in there. The web is still kind of the the cornerstone experience, and then uh, mobile is kind of supplemental. Hopefully, that will change in the future. I would love to be able to use it just for mobile, but it's fairly yeah. complex for a small screen like that. I'm sure it could be done. Uh, anyway, so I would definitely recommend that people check it out, especially if you have like several friends and you want to try together because mm -hmm. you can create a party and you can all work together and keep track of each other's progress and you can like heal your friends when they get low on health and stuff like that. It's actually pretty awesome. I'm going to look that up now. It's really cool. Actually, I wish uh, you'd used it when I was using it a little bit more. I, I kind of slowed down on it just because I have a whole other system for keeping track of tasks, again, which I'll talk about later. And, uh, and so keeping track of everything twice was a little bit of a pain. But I did mm. enjoy, you know, seeing bars fill up. <laughs> but um, but I think, uh, you know, 
I'm going to stick with what I've got for now, but this is really, really great if you don't have an existing system or if you want to try something new or if you just really enjoy that whole concept of leveling up. You can also... There, there are built-in rewards, like you can, you can build up your character, but you can also spend in-game currency on rewards that you define. So if there are things that you want to reward yourself with, like, you know, TV shows or candy or whatever it is you use as a reward for yourself, you can build that in and you can buy it for yourself using kind of the in-game currency, which is cool. Cool. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, gotta get a cough switch or something. So let's just jump on to our next segment, which is called Tool Tip, and it's where we talk about tools and tips and things you can use to stay productive. Mm -hmm. You brought um, some for us. First yes, time. so mine kind of still stems. There's a theme this week of stuff I did while I couldn't move my eyes. Um, <laughs> and so part of another thing that I found that was really useful for me was um, I got started with Pinterest. And um, I used oh, it you? often. Hmm? I wonder if you added me. Sorry, I'm going to go add you. <laughs> oh, cool. Um, I've used it a little bit when I was designing games, but never really, really got into it because I feel like um, Evernote did as good a job or better for me with what I needed. Um, getting into Blender and stuff, though, and I think it's more because it's that more arts and crafts side of things, um, just the visual nature of Pinterest of being able to just scroll through people's boards and seeing, you know, oh, that looks really cool. Maybe I want to try building something like that or oh, that tutorial looks neat, you know, I've been wondering how to do that sort of thing. It's very visual, a great way to organize stuff like that. Um, there are a couple of tips I found online that actually are very useful for it. Um, one is when you're creating boards in Pinterest, to create very specific boards. Because I originally had just one Blender board, and I was, like, putting in, like, cool projects or cool things that I like to look up, plus tutorials, and it was getting very muddled. And so what I found to do was just to split that up into things that are tutorials and things that are cool. And the more granular you can get like that, you'll get a lot of boards ultimately. But then when you're looking for a specific lesson, you can find that. Or if you're looking for something to inspire you, you can find that a lot more easily. The other cool thing that I saw was to create a board just for your completed project so that once you do something, you can shift it over. Because otherwise, you're going to find that your boards get really full really quickly and just become kind of endless and more daunting than inspirational. So those were um, two recommendations I saw in there for using Pinterest effectively. Cool. That actually would be really useful for me because I have been on Pinterest for a while and I've used it, but I've never been very serious and I've never quite figured out how it works for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say I am planning a wedding at the moment and uh, for that purpose it is quite good. Oh yes. Um, and that's kind of where all the stuff is. So if you want to find ideas, it's, it's just such an interesting... The, the whole idea of Pinterest is interesting to me because the... the you're right, like Evernote provides that same function. And I love Evernote. I use Evernote all the time. We'll talk about that in a future episode. But uh, there's nothing that Pinterest does... Well, aside from the browsing, like there's not much that Pinterest does that something like Evernote doesn't do or Google Images doesn't do. And yet... Something about the layout and the community of Pinterest creates this thing that doesn't exist somewhere else. It's so interesting to me. Yeah, it's and that like, intersection, I think. Because yeah. Evernote, you can't look at other people's notebooks. And yeah. Google Images, you'll see a cool image, but you don't know if that's just a gallery. You don't know if that's a tutorial. Whereas Pinterest just gives you that one extra like byline of, oh, this is a tutorial about this. And then you know, oh, that's exactly what I want. You can just pull it in. And it's also got almost a read it later kind of functionality, too, And that you're like, that seems really cool. I don't have time for it right now. I'll just pin it and come back to it later. Yeah. So it's kind of a nice intersection of those things. There's another thing about Pinterest that's really interesting to me, which is the kind of the baseline level of quality for images that you see on there is pretty high. Mm -hmm. And, like, if you're looking for, like, in the case of weddings, for example, if you're looking for like ideas for things to do at a wedding, it's all good. Like in all the design stuff on there, like if you look at houses or even app designs, like I love looking at uh, like a, we can talk about Dribble too, which is like a an uh, UI design website. But you can see that kind of UI design stuff on Pinterest, and it's all really good. And it's just so interesting to me that people have have kind of self policed in this way. Yeah, you know, I just think that's so interesting. And so I, I imagine it's probably the same for game tutorials or whatever else you're working on, Blender tutorials. Oh, yeah. 
stuff, you know, people are going to post the thing, like, the whole idea of Pinterest is to post the things that you think are good. And mm -hmm. so you only get the stuff that's good, which I think is really, really cool, and what makes Pinterest so valuable. And i got to admit, I did not see the point of it when I first used it. And now I totally get it, or at least I think I get it. Or yeah. so maybe when I use it, I'll get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you I think you hit the nail on the head there. Because, like, I mean, because even if I put, put, post something that I think is cool but no one else does, then it's not going to get repinned, so therefore it's not going to bubble up at the top. So it, I right. think the kind of the system they have in place to kind of self-police is really well. That is really interesting, actually. That, it, that actually kind of gives it more of a uh, reddit -y feel. Yeah. Because um, I hadn't thought about it that way, but it, it does have that kind of, um, uh, you know, self what is that, the kind of like dem democratic system where people are, but you're not actively doing it. That's really interesting. Yeah, it's just, on Reddit, if you have actively, actively. Exactly. More passive. Hmm. I wonder if that's what makes it so popular. Maybe. Anyway, I think it's cool. I should spend more time. I don't spend that much time on it right now, but I definitely have used it a lot for the wedding, and it's pretty awesome. So speaking of places where I haven't used a lot, spent a lot of my time, but probably will in the future... Uh, my tool tip for today is a website called IFTT, I -F -T -T -T, which stands for If This Then That. Now, have you, have you used IFT at all? I have. Um, I haven't used it as much lately, but I definitely had a couple recipes going for quite a while when I was living on the East Coast. Yeah. One, one um, of them was weather-based, which is why I don't use it anymore. Was what? Oh, weather? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you don't so have to worry about I that, do you? Email every day saying it's going to be 70 degrees and sunny out. Yep. That sounds pretty nice. Well, I'll be uh, I'll be in a similar boat pretty soon. Um, so I actually I'm looking at mine right now, and I've got four recipes, two of which I just made uh, yesterday, and one of them is called "Post Get It Made Video Episodes to Blog," and it follows the Get It Made um, RSS feed, and when a new episode is posted, it's supposed to <laughs> make a blog post about it. Oh, okay. And Next time I post an episode, I'm going to see what it does, and I have no idea what it's going to look like. But if everything goes the way I really, really hope it does, I won't have to post blog episodes anymore. Awesome. That's because cool. it ties. They have, uh, they have a link to Tumblr, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, man, there's so much stuff in here. So uh, the reason I took another look at it, I've had it forever, and I use it, don't use it, use it, don't use it, and I build uh, recipes, and I delete them, and I, like, I've never found anything that I really, really needed, you know? Because a lot of the stuff on here is, like, life logging, like, you know, I when I take an action, log it in a Google uh, spreadsheet, and I'm like, I don't need that, you know? I, I don't need to know every time I, you know, posted a picture to Facebook, I don't need it saved. Although, uh, what I did do is I, I do have one here, uh, one recipe here that will download new Facebook photos I'm tagged in to Dropbox. So when other people post pictures of me, and I want to be aware of them, I can see them, which is kind of cool. Um, I'll talk about some other recipes I have, but, but first I should probably clarify. A recipe is like a short program where you can say, if something happens, then do an action. That's what if this, then that is all about. I probably should have said that up front. So, uh, so if will watch all of your web services, and it's, there's tons of web services that are now integrating with them, and when something that you prescribe happens, it will take an action. So the reason that I've been looking at it uh, a lot more lately is because in the new version of Launch Center Pro, which is an app that I will talk about in detail in the future, uh, in the new version of Launch Center Pro, they added IFT integration. So now when I open up Launch Center, I can tap a button to launch an IFT, uh, to, to like activate a, an IFT recipe. So I'm still kind of figuring out what the implications of that are, uh, but I just added one the other day called uh, Save a URL to Pocket with Launch Center Pro, and basically it kind of cuts down on how many actions I have to take to save something to Pocket, like a, if I have a link that I want to save for later. Because generally the way it works is you open up the Pocket app, and if you have a link in your clipboard, it will pop up with a little add button. And so what you have to do is, in your browser, you tap the top, you copy the link, you go to your home page, you open up Pocket, and then you hit Add, and now you've got your uh, your link from the clipboard in Pocket, uh, which is a few steps. 
And a certain amount of steps are kind of unavoidable. There's a little bit faster way to do it with a bookmarklet. But in Chrome, you have to type out the name of the bookmarklet and then hit it, and then it will save your link in Pocket. Mm -hmm. And that kind of takes a lot of steps, too, because you've got a lot of you know letters to type. Because um, usually I have to type the whole word Pocket before it will know which one I want. Yeah. Um, so what I'm trying right now is this, this uh, Launch Center Pro thing. Launch Center Pro, I could talk about you know at length, and I will at some point but it's basically a series of buttons that you define to be whatever you want, and you can even have button groups. So you can see I hit this button right here. Shit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I can hit this button right here, and additional buttons appear, right? So there's kind of like a swiping thing happening there where I can swipe to whichever thing I want. You can make menus for yourself. So, for example, if I tap this person, a menu comes up with all the things I can do for them. I can call them. I can email them. I can message them. And if I hit message, then there's even more options. Message, message with the last photo I took, send a message with a GIF attached. There's all kinds of different things I can do. Oh. Um, and I'm still in the very, very early stages of figuring out how to use it. But it's got me back into the world of if, because I can do things like take the URL from my uh, clipboard and send it to, lump, to uh, Pocket without having to leave the app. So if I hit that button, that send this URL to Pocket, then I can go on and do something else, and I don't have to go to Pocket to add the URL. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's making it a little bit easier to do app intercommunication, which hopefully will become easier in general in iOS 8. But right now, it's kind of a pain to get stuff from app to app. So this is going to make it a little bit easier. I will report back after I explore a little bit more and find more uh, stuff that I can do with if. Because like I'm, I'm not sure I'm an if believer yet. Like I think it's a really great service, and I love the idea. But I just haven't found the workflows that, or the uh, actions that, or whatever they're called, recipes that work, are useful for me, you know? Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way. Um, it really, they, they have a lot of things that come out, like for Nest, for the, um, I think it's Philips has the multicolored LED lights that came out that, like, kind of, like, had the ooh and ah factor of, like, oh, you can, if it's going to rain, you can have your lights change to blue, and it seems very cool, but it's, yeah, finding that usability thing of what is, like, the really useful thing for your life going to be. Yeah, that stuff does seem like kind of a killer app for it. Mm -hmm. Like, the uh, it's the, the Philips Hue lights, the Belkin Wemo power strip things that turn your devices on and off, mm -hmm. um, some of the home security stuff. That stuff really makes sense to me. Like, when I walk into the house, turn on the lights. That is valuable. Or when yeah. I, uh, you know, when the sun goes down, turn on the lights. Or yeah. when I enter this room, play this music. Like, that's really, really interesting to me. And I just don't have any of the hardware yet. Like, I, I don't have a house, as you can see, I have a, an apartment. So, like, I'm not ready to automate my whole home yet, because I only got two rooms, you know? It doesn't make sense. But in the future, I will definitely be interested in that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. Hopefully, uh, I'll get a chance to play with that stuff at some point. Uh, all right, so now we're going to move on to the workflow segment where we talk about how we work. And if you out there are interested in sharing with us how you work, go ahead and email us at... Uh, I'm sorry, no. <laughs> you can email us... Or actually, first of all, you can find us on Twitter at Get It Made Show, uh, or you can email us at uh, getitmadeshow at gmail.com, which I did not add to the list here, so I'm going to do that. Uh, and maybe put workflow in the subject line or hashtag workflow or something like that if you want to tell us uh, something we should talk about. Get it made show. We want to hear from you. We do want to hear from you. We would love to hear from you. So, uh, so today we're going to hear from me because we haven't heard from you yet. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit about something that's kind of a deep topic. I'm just going to skim it. Uh, but it's called getting things done which are abbreviated GTD, and it's a, it started out as a book by this guy named David Allen, uh, and it's funny, like, I have the book, and I read about half of it, and honestly, there's a page in that book with a diagram that pretty much sums up the whole thing, and if you just look at the diagram, you'll get it, like, you don't have to read the whole book, uh, and it's valuable if you want the book. Huh? I find it ironic that you didn't finish the Getting Things Done book. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I'm still getting things done, so I guess not getting that done. Not the spirit of it, at least. Yeah. 
So, um, but the, the system, to me anyway, has been hugely valuable. I mean, it's just totally turned around my productivity process and, and made me capable of completing long-term multi-part projects that I just had a lot of trouble with in the past. Uh, and as a kind of software productivity junkie, I found, I, the first thing I did was like find a software solution to manage this for me. But I want to talk a little bit about what getting things done, like what the, the methodology is, and then I'll talk about the application that I use to manage it. Um, do you have a, a system that you use for keeping track of all the stuff you need to do? Um, not an effective one for work. I um, use tasks just through Outlook, which has been, I found to be the most effective thing. Um, I need to set something up for the, all the other stuff I'm doing right now with computer science and CG and game design and all that, because it does get away from me very easily. And that's actually this kind. Of, I think this. I feel like this is going to kind of tie into our next our discussion topic of staying productive. So, yeah, I hope so because the uh, the reason I added that topic is mm -hmm. because I need help in that department. So first, I'm going to try to sell you on getting things done and see if it's something you're interested in, okay. and then you can help me stay productive in a uh, chaotic schedule <laughs> environment. So, um, so, so the deal with GTD or getting things done, is that it, it really speaks to my inability to manage everything in my brain. Like, I, uh, I just can't keep track of it all by just remembering. Like, if I'm at work and someone says, hey, I need this project by next week, and then I go to another room and someone else is like, hey, I need this other project by tomorrow, the next week thing is already long gone. Like, I can't keep track of it. And so I needed a technological solution to help me deal with that. I actually even wrote a whole um, extended paper thing on uh, the phenomenon of distributed cognition while I was in grad school and the idea of extending your brain using software. And specifically, I was, uh, I was writing about Evernote in that case where I was talking about extending your brain's storage capabilities. But, uh, but GTD apps or the GTD system, which you can do without any technological devices, is is kind of the same idea where you're extending your ability to, uh, you know, to plan and keep track of stuff by first collecting it and then categorizing it. So the idea, and I'm looking at the at GTD's website right now, uh, but the, the idea is that there are five steps. So step one is capture. Uh, so the idea is whenever you think of something that needs doing, you have to immediately capture it, uh, and this that generally means writing it down, or if you're using an application, there's a place in the application where you can capture it. But the idea is you capture everything that's got your attention right now, everything that you intend to do. As you think of it, you just plop it in there, and you don't even think about it. It's just as fast as I can, I just want to empty my brain. And then the idea is you've put your, uh, your things that you need to do into a trusted system where you no longer worry or have cognitive overhead about what needs doing, you're confident that what needs doing has been managed or is going to be managed. So you don't have to worry about it. And it really is pretty freeing to not have to think about all the things you have to do. Uh, so step two is clarify. And that means processing the things that you wrote down and figuring out what they mean. So you might have written yourself a note. Now you have to turn that note into actionable steps. So everything that you actually move on after this step of the process is going to be a single step thing that needs doing. Um, so if you wrote down, uh, like, I have to write thank you notes for some gifts that I received. So write thank you notes is a multi-step process. What I really need to do is write down individually what notes need to be written or what things need to be done. Uh, and that helps because it means that you have smaller tasks that are more manageable. And every time you read a task, once you've gotten through this step, you should, it should be 100% clear what will be done, right? Like what's written is exactly what needs to be done and not just a clue about something that needs to be done. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't just write a short reminder to myself that's very vague. I would be very, very specific about what needs, uh, what actual step I need to take. Uh, step three is to organize the things you've done or the, the things that you've, categor that you've uh, clarified. So now that you have individual steps and it's clear exactly what you're going to do, you're going to organize it based on what category it's in or when it needs to be done, stuff like that. Uh, and I'll talk more about that when I actually show you the application. 
Uh, step four is to reflect, and the this is where I'm a little deficient. I gotta work on this. Um, and the idea is like every day you reflect on kind of the stuff that you did that day, and every week you look through the whole system and you trim all the things that uh, you you decided aren't that important to do or that need to be reorganized or have their due dates changed or anything like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the idea is you're doing this weekly review that um, gives you an overall sense and makes it so that nothing gets lost in the system. And I have not been doing that. I do the daily reviews, but not the weekly reviews. So I need to uh, need to reflect a little bit more. And then step five is to actually do the stuff. So uh, oh, what's cool about that is that it's all organized, it's all taken care of, and it's all actionable. So you can say, I want to do these five things today. And then you have a list of things to do today. You can do them. You can feel good about them being done. You're never worried that you forgot something or that you uh, just that what you need to do didn't make it in. Like everything that you, every thought that you had made it into the system. Every uh, reminder became a list of actionable items. And then when the time comes to actually do something, it's always very, very clear what needs to be done. And that really appeals to me. Does that yeah, seem that like seems, something you'd want to use? That seems very useful, especially with me uh, working from home now, because it's everything is very, from that perspective, everything is very much you know self-driven. It's not like I'm going to run into someone in the hallway and they're going to remind me, oh, by the way, how's X, XYZ project going? You know, it's basically on me to remember that this is due this day, this is due this day sort of thing. Um, it's funny, actually, you mentioned about, like, kind of the, the first step of, of capturing, I believe you called it, yeah. and, you know, writing everything down. I'll have moments of that where, like, once every couple of weeks, I'll just be, like, you know, working on three projects at once and be like, okay, I just need to write all these down, but that's about as far as I've really taken it. Um, it sounds like this takes that a few steps further in a really useful way. Yeah, it's it the the first step I actually think is the most important, and it's funny because it's the least organized of all the steps, and the whole thing is an organization system. But uh, but the idea of not trusting your brain to con to take care of everything was the biggest step I had to take. Mm -hmm. But I was willing to take it because I knew that my brain wasn't handling it very well. Like uh, I I know that I don't remember to do stuff, so. Yeah having that spelled out for me that like, oh, if you if you trust, if the system that you trust is the computer, then that's where you should put your stuff. Or if the system that you trust is pen and paper, then that's where you should put your stuff. And I was like, oh, that actually makes perfect sense. Like, if I know I'm going to forget, and I know the computer is not going to, then I should put it in the computer. And then mm -hmm. I have a trusted system, and I don't have to worry. And the worrying is where all the, the cognitive overhead is. That, you know, when you're thinking, like, oh, what was that other thing I had to do? That's a waste yeah. of time if you could instead have put that other thing you had to do into the system the moment you thought of it and then got on with your life, you know? Yeah. Um, so the way I do getting things done, and everybody has their own way. The guy who actually uh, who kind of wrote the book and, and does all the seminars and everything, he does it on paper, which, you know, for him is great. It doesn't work for mm -hmm. me. I'm the paper guy. Uh, but everybody has their own way of doing it. I used to use a bunch of different apps, and eventually I broke down and I went with Things, which is an app that is for Mac, but also available for other iOS platforms. Uh, and it's <laughs> kind of stupidly expensive, and it was a little bit silly for me to buy it, but I don't care because I love it and I got tons of value out of it. Uh, but it was a little bit of a stretch for me to, to make the jump because it's so expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are other apps like uh, Wonderlist and ToDo and a million others that range from free to relatively inexpensive to wildly expensive, depending on what you care about uh, yep. and how much of the organization you want to do yourself. So the deal with things is that it's automatically like already set up to do this GTD stuff, and uh, and you can just use it, and it's really really great. But if you oh, don't mind setting things up yourself, uh, Wonderlist, actually, in addition to being free, it looks a lot like things. Uh, but you have to set all the categories up yourself. Also, if you're an Evernote junkie, there is a website called The Secret Weapon, or a system called The Secret Weapon, that is basically a series of videos and other documents kind of explaining how you can set up a GTD system within Evernote. So if you like to use Evernote to keep track of what you need to do, especially if you like their new reminders feature, uh, you can use the secret weapon to do that. And I've heard some people who swear by the secret weapon. They say it's really great. So if that appeals to you and you like to use things that are free or you already live in the world of Evernote, then you can do that. 
Personally, I don't know... What? I said that's good to know. Yeah, I don't know if I could handle every to-do that I have being an Evernote note, but uh, but it depends on how you use Evernote. So things... I'm going to open it up right now. Things really appeals to me because it's built for GTD, so it's got all that stuff already in there, kind of like ready to go. Uh, so at the very top in the, the sidebar, there is an inbox, and in the inbox there is like, all the stuff that you did from your brain dump, right? So, like, if you have a, an idea about something that needs doing, you just put it in the inbox right away. And the, and things is designed to be easy to get stuff into. So uh, I have a keyboard shortcut that's universal across my whole machine that I can hit, and I can just type something in right away, and it goes into the inbox for me to process later. Uh, or on, the, on my phone, I can add stuff just by going into the app. I can go into the inbox, and I can add something. Uh, but it's much faster to do something like do it with voice. So Things lets you set up a list in the Reminders app that you can have kind of auto-import into things. So I, I named my list Things, and I use Siri when I want to make a note, and I say, Siri, you know, put whatever I'm thinking of into my Things list. Okay. And it will put that thing into the Things list, and then Things scans that list, and it adds the thing to my inbox. So if I need to get groceries, I could say, Siri, add get groceries to my things list. And it will add get groceries to my things list in reminders, but then things sees that and it pulls it into things. So you basically get the kind of voice reminders thing, which is nice. Yep. Uh, and actually, I'm going to play around in the near future, since I was talking about Launch Center Pro and Ift and things like that, I'm going to play around with some automated to-do manager stuff where I can add things automatically using Ift and Launch Center Pro. So uh, I'll report back on that after I you know, spend a bunch of time messing around with this week. Uh, but after the uh, kind of collection phase where you're just putting all the stuff into your inbox, the next section of the window is called Focus, and it's kind of divided up into categories. So the, the first thing there is today, and that's all the things that you wanted to do that day. You can kind of label things today or not today. Uh, and it will just show you the today ones. But what's cool about this is if you set due dates or you set reminder dates, then it will make things appear in today on the day that you intend to do them. So okay. like if I am working on something, I'm like, oh, I need to revisit this on Friday, I just put that under scheduled, and I can schedule it to reappear in the today screen on Friday. So hmm. that's usually helpful for me because I can put something aside and know it's taken care of. Uh, because if I'm doing something and I'm like, oh, I'm going to totally do that on Friday, I'm not going to do it on Friday unless I make sure that it's going to reappear for me. Yeah. Um, so that's really valuable for me. Then there's the next section, which is not just the stuff that's showing up on a certain day, but just everything that needs to be done next. And this is like a just big, big list of stuff I need to do. And it's all set up you know, by category so I can see, like, you know, what, I, what do I need to do for get it made? What do I need to do for just general home stuff? What do I need to do to prepare to move? What do I need to do to prepare for the wedding? Uh, and it's all kind of divided out. So that's kind of the everything view. Then there are other things like uh, scheduled, where I can see only the stuff that I've scheduled for future days. I can see my someday list, which is all the stuff that I may eventually do or may get rid of. And that's kind of the thing that you want to review weekly. And oh. I need to be better about that, just cleaning that out and getting stuff out of there if there's stuff I don't want in there. Uh, and then I also have a projects view and an areas of responsibility view. So like we were talking before about how you organize all the stuff from your inbox. So not only do you put it in there and you turn it into actionable steps, but you also have to put it into categories. And projects and areas of responsibility are where those go. So projects are things like get my California teaching license, improve my YouTube channel, plan my wedding, move to California. Uh, and then areas of responsibility are things like home and work and get it made um, is a new one that I just made. Okay. Um, so with all those different categories, I can keep track of what goes with what, and if I decide, oh, I want to work on wedding stuff right now, I can just hit wedding plans, and there's all the stuff that needs to be done for the wedding. Or if I want to work on the move, I just hit move to California, and all of the stuff for the move comes up. So it keeps things compartmentalized, but then if I go to the today view or the next view, I can still see all together, like here's everything that needs doing. Yeah, I feel like this would be incredibly useful for me. If, if not, uh, this particular software, the system. Yeah, um, you do not have to invest to the degree that I've invested in this specific software to mm -hmm. have this system 
be really, really helpful for you. Um, if you really love Evernote, like really, really love it, definitely check out The Secret Weapon. Uh, okay. And also there are Evernote, like, I don't know if I'd call them add-ons, but like apps in the Evernote ecosystem that are specifically mm-hmm. made for GTD, but they store all your stuff in Evernote, but they kind of present a different interface for it. Uh, and I'll see if I can dig those up. They're kind of cool. Um, Wonderlist is the closest thing to things that's free, probably. Uh, but to do, like the number two and then do, is really mm-hmm. great, and that's a lot less expensive. I used that for a very long time. Um, there's so many options. Everybody wants to build the perfect to-do list. Uh, and I really love things, but it's not the best for everybody. Like, everybody's going to have their own thing. And like I said, you can do this on paper, too. Like, whatever you like is what you should use. But I, I swear by the system. Like, it has totally enabled me to... Like, I it feel so much more capable now that I'm using it than I ever did before. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's- that seems really useful, too, because then this kind of leads into the idea of staying productive, because it helps you prioritize things. Yeah. I found one of the worst things for me is that, like, I'll have, like, two or three things I want to do, and so I end up doing none of them because I don't want to choose one or the versus the other. Whereas yeah. if you have the system and you're like, okay, this is the next thing on my priority list, then mm-hmm. it makes that decision for you. It really is beautiful. Like, if, you, if you're really serious about this stuff, then you sit down to it every day and you say, I'm going to do everything on this list in order. And mm-hmm. then you never have to make a decision. And making a decision is, is what that cognitive overhead that I was talking about. It's like the, the thing that slows you down is having to make choices. And actually, I'm going to talk at some point. I wanted to do it today and I didn't fit it in today, but I want to talk about the paradox of choice, which is like a, I think there's actually a book, but just the concept of the paradox of choice is really interesting and the idea that it's, it's challenging and difficult to make choices, and then if you minimize choice for yourself, that's actually a really valuable skill. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we got to keep things moving. I, I, I don't have a counter to see how long we've been going, so I think we need to keep the we discussion going. We're close to short. an hour at this point. Okay, I was actually not as bad as I thought. I thought we were, like, wildly over. Um, um, let's, let's have a, a kind of a short discussion, then we'll wrap things up. As all right. Behind me. Uh, so... This discussion is kind of a question I have for you today. Sure. Uh, and I will selfishly gobble up your advice. Um, but I wanted to talk about how to stay productive when you're in an environment where you're not living on someone else's schedule. Um, so my situation is that I am a public school teacher, or I was most recently a public school teacher, and I finished up in June, and I'm going to be moving out to California in August. So I am done with one job, not yet started another job, don't know what that next job is going to be yet. So everything is kind of in limbo. And I'm making very effective use of GTD because I am planning my wedding, I'm planning the move, and I'm doing the job search all at the same time. And I'm doing it entirely on my own schedule with nobody to tell me, you know, what to do and when. And uh, I'm finding that I'm pretty effective at planning the wedding and planning the move and not getting a whole lot done on the job front. Like, it's kind of, it's really easy, even with a system like this, to procrastinate the things you really don't want to do by doing the things that you kind of don't want to do. Because you know they all need to be done, and you just take the path of least resistance, and a lot of things get done, but the most important things sometimes don't. Do you ever experience that? Oh, yeah, definitely. There are, I mean, my my apartment is always cleanest when I have a big project I need to be working on, because I'm like, oh, Go and do that instead, and it's wonderful. Yes. And it's great Absolutely. because it is a productive thing you're doing, but it's not the thing you need to be doing. Yeah, I am so with you on that. I mean, my apartment's very clean today, as a matter of fact. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's totally my experience. So, you now you work, you're working at home, working remotely, correct? Correct. But you're somewhat on their schedule? I am, yeah. I work basically <laughs> 6 to 2, 2.30. So 6 in the morning to 2.30 in the afternoon every day. Um, and then from the afternoon on, it's my own time. Okay. It's actually funny because that's pretty close to what my schedule was as a teacher. Yeah. Except that was the prescribed schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, and afternoon time is real nice, I must say. It is. Uh, so did, does that kind of predispose you to a certain schedule of your own? Or do you have a lot of freedom within that framework? Um, 
I mean, I have, it, it really depends. It changes from day to day based on how many meetings I have. If it's a day where I don't have any meetings, then it's basically my time and I can, you know, take, you know, work on projects as I want to. If I have meetings every half hour, every other half hour, <clears> then it becomes much more of a having to, you know, go to the meeting, have my mindset on the meeting, then go back, work on something, you know, knowing that in another half hour I'm going to have to leave for another meeting sort of idea. Yeah. And so kind of go, you have to go back and forth, which makes it a lot more difficult to be productive. And I think that's one of the key things is learning or figuring out how to make use of those short spans of time. Because there are times where it's really easy if you, like, and it, it was more so when I was actually in the office and I would have to walk to a meeting room and walk back, sit down at my desk and be like, I've got 10 minutes between now and when I have to get up again and go to another meeting. Is there really anything useful I can do? And I think actually the getting getting things done idea kind of makes sense with this because you said you're, you're really breaking it down into really simple and clear steps. Yep. So chances are there's a step you can get done in those 10 minutes. Like if you have, you need something small enough that you can get it done in that kind of amount of time. So the more granular you can make your um, to-do list, I think the better it is for staying productive. Yeah, everybody has their own level of willingness in terms of like how, how deep they're willing to go with like labeling. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of the default tags that are available in things when you first install it are things like 5 minutes and 15 minutes. Okay. So you could tag a task 5 minutes or 15 minutes if it's a task that's going to take about that long. And you could, for example, return for a meeting, see that you have 5 minutes, hit the 5 minutes button, there's all your 5 minute tasks, you just pick one and you do it. Okay. And that's potentially really valuable, but to be completely honest, I deleted those tags because I found myself never using them. Because I just yeah. found it difficult to estimate how long tasks are going to take, and often they take a lot longer than I think. Maybe mm -hmm. that just speaks to my own inability to estimate. No, but, I do the same. I think everyone does that to a certain extent. Because I do the yeah. same thing. Like I'll start a project thinking, oh, this will take me an hour, and then three hours later, I'm halfway done. Yeah, I think my my Achilles heel in that department is that I I use how interested I am in a task to determine how long it's going to take, which is absolutely mm -hmm. the wrong way to go. But if it's something that seems easy or interesting to me, I'll be like, oh, I can do that in 20 minutes. And then, mm -hmm. of course, it ends up being longer. Or if it's something that I really don't want to do, I'll kind of make an assumption that it's going to take longer when it might not necessarily. Sometimes I'll sit down to do something I've been dreading, and I finish it in 10 minutes, and I'm like, oh, that was easy. Why did yeah. I worry so much about that? But especially, like, computer troubleshooting tasks. Like, if someone comes to me with a problem, and I'm like, oh, dude, we can fix this in 10 minutes, and then I'm with them for an hour. Because yeah. I was just like, oh, it's so easy. Like, uh, my, um, what's the word for a, the your fiancé's aunt? My aunt-in-law? I don't know. Anyway, my aunt-in-law um, had a computer issue that is a permissions problem. And I was like, oh, whatever. I'll just run a, you know, reset permissions. It'll be done in five minutes. And then I ran a, you know, a permissions check, and it said everything was fine. And I still haven't fixed it because <laughs> she hasn't called me back yet. And I'm like, yeah, I'll fix it when she calls me back. But, like, that's been going on for days now, and I just yeah. haven't fixed it when I thought it would be a five-minute thing. So it's sometimes it's hard to estimate. Or maybe I'm just not great at estimating. Anyway, if you yeah, are the kind of person who's good at That's a lot of fun and effort, I think, to have to be able to say, you know, go through each of those tasks then and say, oh, this one's going to be this, this one's going to be this. It's, it's like another step in that front end yeah. that can be very useful, but you have to put that investment in. It depends on how many tasks you're uh, you're dumping at a time. Like the first time you sit down to it, you mm -hmm. might be, excuse me, might be kind of emptying your brain of a whole lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's kind of a stream of consciousness thing where you think of something and you just put it in real quick. Yeah. And when you're doing that, sometimes it's okay to do a little categorization as you go. Like if I, uh, if I open up my keyboard shortcut here, I get a window that says, you know, new to do, and I can type in whatever to do thing I want. And then I could just press enter, and it'll be in there. And most of the time, that's what I do. But if I want to, I can put on tags. I can add notes. I can say what it's to do. I can say you know, which, where to categorize it. Uh, so I can do all that categorization right away if I want to. But uh, I generally only do that when it's something where the due date is like obvious. Like if I get an email, and it's like, I need this thing by this date, then I don't want to forget. So I will take all the contents of the email and put them into the to-do item. And then I can archive the email and never look at the email again, but mm -hmm. this new item has all the information. And then it's already kind of pre-categorized. But if it's just an idea I had, I don't categorize it. I just type it all out. 
put it right in there. Um, so I guess let's see. So so I guess my issue is more motivation than than organization. Mm -hmm. I don't have I have the organization thing down, but I'm looking at a list of seven things I was supposed to do today. <laughs> Not all of them got done. In fact, I might go uh, write some thank you notes after I finish this recording. Um, the other yeah, thing is really tough. What? Oh, I was gonna say. I guess from the motivation standpoint, like, and it's tough to do in certain cases. But I guess one of the things you can also do is try to try to break down things into things that you can have some sort of result at the end that you're like, you know, I, you know, or that sense of accomplishment idea. Like, I know, like this comes particularly from board game design for me, like, it can seem like a slog working on a game, and you're like, oh, I'm tired of working on this thing at this point. I've, you know, worked on this mechanic for forever, and I'm done with it. I'm tired of it. But then once you get it to the table and play test it, it's sort of that, like, thrilling moment of seeing it in action, and, you know, it totally, like, rejazzes you for stuff. And I feel like you can do that on a micro level, like, with it, any given project. If it's like, oh, I need to get this done and do this step, and so long as you have something at the end that you can show for that step, then you know, that's good. Like, for example, when you do those thank you notes, you'll have them all in their envelopes and addressed and stamped and ready to go, and you'll have that, you know, physical thing that you've done that. It's tougher on things like the job search, because there it's, you know, you've sent out an email, and you don't know if they're going to call you back or anything yet, so it's tougher to figure out what that reward factor is at the end of that sort of thing, but I think adding that reward factor really helps with the motivation issue. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, make myself an achievement for applying to 50 jobs or whatever. There you go. Eh, that's, that's not, not actually, out of the question, actually. Either. Huh? That's not a bad idea at all. No, I mean, um, actually, Habit RPGs is fantastic for stuff like that, because I mean, you can set that kind of stuff up really easily. Um, but now that I'm not using Habit, you know, like, because Habit RPG and things are kind of redundant, I yep. had to pick one, and obviously I went with the one that I like more and am way more invested in, because mm -hmm. I spent a lot of money on it. So, like, for me, it's checking the box in things that is the, the feel-good moment. Yep. But, uh, but maybe I can kind of add more feel-goodiness to that whole idea. That's something I'll have to think about. So uh, I think we're going to finish it up there, and then uh, we will return next week, hopefully with some more exciting, flashy production mm -hmm. and a whole new host of stuff to talk about. Yes. So before we go... Uh, I want to give you guys some information about where you can find us in case you want to chat us up and tell us what you want to hear. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at Rocketude. You can find me on YouTube at mlipsonvids. You can find me on GitHub at Rocketude if you want to take a look at any of the code that I've written. And my website is mikelipson.com. You can find me on Twitter at boardgameben.com or my blog at boardgameben. Or sorry, you can find me on Twitter at boardgameben. You can find me on my blog at boardgamebed.com. I'll have a new um, post up tomorrow, um, which is probably not when you'll be watching this, but um, about the Blender stuff I've been doing, so feel free to check that out. Um, and pretty much anywhere else you can find me at Marshall Kowski. Awesome. And if you want to get more information about the show or follow what the show is up to, you can see the show on Twitter at getitmadeshow.com. No, I did the same thing you just did. You can find it on Twitter at getitmadeshow. Uh, the website is getitmadeshow.tumblr.com, and eventually we may get a domain that's a little bit more interesting, but that's a good one for now. Uh, you can email the show at getitmadeshow at gmail.com. You can find the videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash user slash mlipsonvids. Uh, on iTunes, you can listen to the show if you search for Get It Made, and we will have some sort of live uh, taping thing available in the near future. Right now we're doing it with Hangouts on Air, in the future, we may skip over to doing some sort of Ustream thing or something like that so we can get all our production stuff in there. So more information on that coming soon. It's going uh, so It is. So uh, in closing, thanks for listening or watching, and we will see you guys next week. Thanks for watching, everybody.